All right, let's get started. Wonderful. So yes, today we're talking about metaphysics of self. This is probably one of the more interesting uh, classes of the semester. I think when people think Indian philosophy, like this tends to be what they think about, like these very, uh, these very kind of abstract questions of like, who am I? Like, what is the universe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I guess like, who, who does this, this topic sound interesting to? Okay, I, I guess I hyped it up for this time, but let's see. All right, so icebreaker is very straightforward, but also maybe not so for today. Um, let's start with, actually, let's not start with Krishna. Let's start with uh, who wants to go first. It's, it's intentionally uh, vague. Um, who are you? Who wants to go first? Yes, hold on. Oh, with a name, a name. That's that's a good response. It's like a large category. Like it's like a folder, like on a folder. Yeah, it's like a it's like a pointer, right? And then you have like an entire object that points to that. Intriguing. Uh, who wants to go next? An absolute beast. An absolute beast. That's an, that's an interesting mm -hmm. response. Uh, why do you say that? Because it's true. That's, that's yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I could, yeah, there, like there's very uh, kind of generic things you can assert of yourself, right? Like predicates you can assert. Interesting, who, who, who else? You guys don't know who you are? Or are you like thinking of like good responses? I guess, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, if I were to answer the question seriously, um, I must associate myself as being the daughter of my parents. Interesting. Yeah, I guess like relations to other people is like a pretty strong like demarcator of identity. Yeah. Chris? Oh, okay. So I'm going to say that. I am a homo sapien that engages in intellectual cultural activities with other homo sapiens that are situated in the fourth body, the arm of the American galaxy, and the other arm of the solar system. That's a that's a good response. That's a good response. It can it can also be like very generic, right? Like you're you like have a response like like that only narrows it down to like seven billion people, right? Like like say you that you're in this like one part of the galaxy. And that you're a homo sapiens like i don't know that's that's still very broad right like what what sort of defines an individual as themselves as opposed to other people uh who else Krishna. i would feel like i would be made up of a series of experiences in my life to mm. i guess be the person who i am today yeah like all these experiences like over time, like impart stuff onto you, right? Like that you self, and over time, you just become like a, a bunch of experiences. That's actually like basically the Buddhist Kutgala point of view, which we'll talk about later today. Uh, who else? Nathan? Who are you? I am who I am. I guess that's like a clean response because like saying I, like as soon as you say I, then like you have like, in a sense, it's like a unique ref referrer, right? Like if I say I, it can only mean like I. Interesting approach. Uh, who else? Who is not? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, I think I would also like Mm -hmm. At the same time, like, I don't know, I'm thinking about this question. Like, there's so many different ways that you could describe who you are. Mm. Because it's like, what am I doing right now? Or like, where am I? For example, like, I'm a student at Carnegie Mellon and like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, something like that. Um, like, I don't know how to remove externalities from mm. my description of myself because, like, CMU is not me. Yeah. And so it's like, 
Hmm. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, like we can try adding like a ton of information, right? Like I go to see you on this, 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 this. I'm like, that'll like, that could like theoretically narrow it down to like just you. Like there's probably something unique there, but like you've only defined yourself in relation like, to other things. To other things yeah. yeah. That's kind of what I was trying to say, but I couldn't find the words for it. Right. And, and I guess like this is like a recurring theme of like, how do you, how do you like identify things without uh, relation to other things and maybe is that a futile pursuit and maybe it's completely fine that we identify things in relation to other things. Um, Mari, did you go? Oh, you stole the I am quite oh. oh no. <laughs> Isn't it like a point of I Is it? I think in Hebrew, the word Yahweh means I am. Oh, I've heard of that, but like I, I, I don't think it's like proven. Is it like? Yeah, it's like, yeah, hold on. Yeah, but like it, it doesn't like yeah. So it's like Y H H. But like it, it doesn't uh, like it, it's back a little bit. But like it doesn't uh, like it's just a theory of the origin of the name. Um, like it isn't proven. Like and like it's it's sort of like flimsy etymological evidence. Like it could be a folk etymology or whatnot. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I heard of that. Wait, uh, Mari. Yeah. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm uh, confused. What? <laughs> I am confused. Hi, confused. <laughs> oh, that's actually like a. There's some interesting kind of like philosophy of language about like behind that dad joke. That that dad joke. I imagine where it's like. I'm hungry. Hi, hungry. It's like, what, like, what, what predicates of yourself can you actually identify? Like, like that you can identify with, right? Like, you can say, like, I am like hungry, but you can say, I am Mari. I am a person, right? Like, you can say, like, hi, like, you could, like, it's fair to say, like, hi, person, or like, hi, stranger. Like I am a stranger or something like that, right? But like you cannot say hi hungry. Like, why can you not say that? Like there's certain things that we deem um that we deem like unreferable. Yeah. I think sometimes uh, I think sometimes when people are hungry, they can be consumed by the hunger. <laughs> and then the pie slope. Right? Like when you're hello. angry. Yeah. Like, hello, hungry. Actually, you know what? Yeah, like I could see a situation in which, like, like at the at, when you go to like a restaurant or something, like I could imagine it being like on the on like the door, like or like in one of those like McDonald's ads, like "Hello, hungry? Like, would you like a <laughs> large fries or something like that?" Like, like, part of the Snickers commercials. Yeah, 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 exactly. Something like that, maybe. Okay, cool. Uh, did we miss anyone on this? Uh, oh yeah, Nathan. Regarding uh, Yahweh and I, and, uh, I don't think it's uh, that might be like a logic to use that, but in the story of in Exodus, mm. when God is talking to Moses in the burning bush, if Moses asks, "Who are you?" Mm -hmm. and God says, "I am that I am," and then He says, "You shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you." I am. Yeah. And and like, what is that in Hebrew? Oh, okay, okay. Interesting. Yeah, no, no, that, that's a very interesting kind of uh, connection. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's move into like actual content. Uh, unless anyone has any any other thoughts. Okay, cool. Also, does anyone have a scissor? Because I'm going to be like fidgeting with this for the entire. Uh, thank you, Chris. All right. So, uh, um, oh, you know, okay, fine. It's whatever. A scissor. What well, what would I say instead? Can I have a scissor? Can I have scissors? Yeah. Wait. I also say scissors. Can I have a Wait. Wait. Are you sure? Yeah. I've never heard of it. I have a scissor. Can I have a scissor? 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 Can I
I don't know. I don't know. I'm aware of the fact that scissors is correct. Yeah, wait, now that I think about it, yeah, like scissors, right? Like a pair of scissors. A pair of scissors. But also, like, I know people who really say that I have scissors. Like, I didn't realize that was off until you pointed out that yeah. I have scissors. Those data. Those oh yeah, data is supposed to be plural. Yeah, data is supposed to be Okay, but whatever. Uh if anyone has exquisitely sharp teeth after class, that, that will come in handy. Um okay, so uh all right, so huh? Where did you get that from? Oh, this is for a buggy. No, booth. It's like like booth building. So like you have to wear this and you have like a hard hat and stuff. So I had to pick that up. So. Um, okay, so uh, I guess this like goes back to what we were just talking about, right? We can say things like, I am six feet tall, I am happy, I am 42 years old, blah, 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 blah. Like, who is the I here, right? Like, when we're saying these things, sometimes it's physical, right? I am six feet tall means like my body is like six feet tall, or I am happy is like some mental state, or I am 42 years old means like, uh, like temporally some quality of, of this body. Um, uh, but like, who is the I here? And like with, with the age thing, for example, like it's well known that like all the atoms in your body are like replaced like every seven years or something like, like over the course of seven years, like every atom will get replaced. So it's sort of like the uh, uh, the, the ship of Theseus, right? Uh, where you have this analogy. Who, who has heard of the ship of Theseus? Okay, yeah, does someone want to explain the ship of Theseus, Krishna? Uh, it's basically a really old ship and then I guess it's in a museum or something. And like, I guess the planks start rotting, so they start like replacing them. And like after some time, like all the planks are replaced, so it's still the same ship. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I guess it's the same thing here, right? So like who is the I? Does anyone have any like preliminary answers to like what I might refer to um, in either all three of these situations or in one of the situations? Right. I guess I I already said like the body. Yeah. Uh, Chris? If so, um, like, there, like, the doctrine presupposes that it's been said, like, it's mm -hmm. like, um, like some action. So, like, yeah, yeah. So, um, in that case, you could, it would be fair to assume that there's some, like, some being that is, like, that, that constitutes the act. Yeah, I mean, someone is saying it, right? Someone is, uh, so, someone is saying it, but when they say it about themselves, um, like they're they're referring to specific things, right? Like uh, I am happy does not refer to like my fingers, uh, but like I uh, I have like long nails or something like does, right? Uh, like like yeah, I don't know. I guess there's like different parts of our our self, right? I mean, how can you localize? Like, sure, there's someone doing the talking, and somehow they're connected to all of these features, but like. Why is it the case that we can just use one referent, like, like one referrer, I, to refer to all these different things? Um, Yashika? I mean, I was going to say that you could just have this one after the body that you could have this one after the body. Despite that, um, like the information is still being transmitted. Like the DNA is the same. Mm -hmm. The like neural connections that you've made are still like, I guess, translated throughout the series. Like neurons also have a long lifespan, so maybe that doesn't apply as well. But like, um, like I guess the point is that the I is like referring to this base consciousness or this base set of information that you were born with, and then that like propagates through like your life. Yeah, like it's at some level of abstraction, I guess, right? Like, yeah. Like this, I like all of these things might affect this, and then uh, we might have like all the atoms and molecules. To like come and go, right? They 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 appear, they they get replaced, right? Um, and now we only have like this set of atoms or whatever. Uh, like some of these crystals go over to this time, like this, like this, like this. But like at some level of abstraction, right? This is lower level. This is like higher level. At some level level of abstraction, there's like this continuity. Right. Yeah. So this yeah, this is basically like the the Pudgala theory of of the Buddhists. Uh, that will that we will talk about. Um, Milo, the que the icebreaker for today was who are you? Someone already did that one, Milo. I'm Roma. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> How do you that's know it's true? true? What is growth? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
like if, if when you're uh, referring to uh, substances that nouns that you use, sure. But when you're using uh, when you have adjectives, it's and. But like like you you don't like you don't have to use and like 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 it, it's it's like a different uh, kind of copula structure in Chinese. And in Sanskrit, you entirely drop the copula actually. You don't even have one. So you just say like um, aham mod or uh, uh, aham thirstman, which is like I, I am thirsty or something like that. Uh, so so okay, interesting. Uh, any other thoughts on this slide? Cool. Uh, no, you actually don't. You actually don't need a copula. You, you can you can add us in your Bhavani at the end, but you don't have that. Yeah. So like like yeah yeah it, it, yeah. It's actually the most common structure. Only in uh, later classical Sanskrit, like the mid centuries AD, you start seeing a lot more like popular That's not like. Uh, no, it's not. It's not just a drop word. Like, like um, this is very common in like cross linguistically. Even um, like even Arabic doesn't have a copula. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Cool. So let's get into our first system of self on analyzing selfhood. Um, so Nyaya Vaisheshika, we've talked a lot about the school. Um, they basically say that mental events are qualities. Um, and this is because they're impermanent and unique. So they can't be in one of the other six ontological categories, file and mission, right? So the other six categories are, uh, we talked about um, like substances, uh, substances, actions, uh, and then like inher inherence, uh, uh, universals, and uh, like two more, whatever. But like, it turns out that like, since they're impermanent, uh, they can't be universals, they can't be inherent, Blah blah blah, blah. Um, and since they're unique, they they only inhere in uh, one one substance at a time. Uh, you can't have a mental event that inheres in multiple substances um, because of that uniqueness property. They can't be substances or actions. Um, <coughs> there's the first uh, throat clearing. That that's a yeah. You guys can count. That that's a good activity. Uh, <laughs> Um, so they're impermanent and unique, so they have to be qualities. Um, so then, uh, since it's a quality, we know that qualities must inhere in some substance, right? Otherwise, they, they can't exist. Um, qualities can't flow freely. So then, what is the substance that mental events must inhere in? Um, that substance, they basically say, is Atman. Atman is the substance that, that these mental events or qualities inhere in. Um, we know that it can't be the body, since the body is divisible. Right, um, a quality can like a substance is only a substance insofar as it is non divisible, um, and the body is uh, divisible. So it ha we have to postulate the existence of some substance that uh, receives the inherence of these mental events. Um, as you can see, though, like this entire chain of reasoning is very bound to Nyaya metaphysics. Um, are there better metaphysical systems? Can anyone think of like a better metaphysical system? Yes, like, like basically like, like modern physics, right? So like, like for, for the most part, like, um, like, like modern physicists like to think that like they're beyond metaphysics, but like it, it is like, an, it is basically a, like a, a metaphysical view to say that like all that exists there's like physical matter and whatnot. But like, it turns out that this metaphysical system is like really good at like predicting things. Um, whereas like the, the Nyaya Vaisheshika school, um, this kind of seven, seven fold ontology isn't that great at predicting like, uh, like partic like particle interactions or like gravity waves. So like you might, based on that like empirical evidence, you might be more inclined to say that modern physics is a more accurate view of reality, and therefore uh, this uh, this uh, this metaphysical system's reasoning is like broken. And they actually have a challenge. There's a there's a Nyayaka scholar from like the 800s AD who's like. Um, Sure, our, our argument is like very bound to our metaphysics. So like, can you find a better metaphysical system and like like prove something different? And like the reason he was able to say that was because the, the, the Nyaya uh, metaphysical system at this time was like very strongly grounded. Like no one could think of like a better, like there were other contrasting metaphysical systems, but the Nyayakas were like the most like rigorous almost in terms of uh, the epistemology. So they were able to make these very strong ontological claims about like what actually exists and people wouldn't really doubt them for it. Um, then we have the indivisibility requirement. Um, I forgot Tanuj wasn't going to be here today, but like 
Uh, split brain patients, does anyone know about this? Um, so like split brain patients, basically it seems like these, you, you have a brain, right? It's like a top down view of a brain and you have this corpus callosum that like, connects the two halves of the brain. And, um, and uh, it turns out that we can like sever this corpus callosum. We can cut the brain in half. And when we do this, we actually get what seems like two entirely separate cells, one of them who can talk and one of them who cannot talk. And uh, this, the, this, the left half can usually talk because it has access to growth of the organ control. Uh, so yeah, so this is like a very strange phenomenon. You'll, you'll, show like, you'll show like one brain through one eye and one thing, and then like this brain won't be able to vocalize about it. And then you'll show like this side, something from the left side, and it won't be able to control, like the right side won't be able to react with the scan. <coughs> or like you'll even show them two things in their two eyes at the same time, and like the hands will like react separately. So this is like a very strange kind of setup um, that uh, arises when we, we when we split a person's brain. So if if the brain is divisible, then like what is the what is the physical substrate of the octopus, right? Because uh, now we've gotten rid of this substance divisibility requirement. Yeah, Chris. So uh, we have like literally no idea. It's like phenomenal. So this is the entire question of phenomenology is both the but like the essence is just like we cannot be this person, right? Like we we are not inside of this person's head, so like, how would we ever know what it felt like to be them? Like, we can ask them questions, but like, answering questions and all this is like constrained by your uh, linguistic ability. And your linguistic, like, for the most part, when we go about our lives, we 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 take language for granted. But like, when you're at this level, you realize like, you're on the you're on like a neurological level where you can't really take linguistic ability for granted. Inside the brain, literally has no access to language function. So like, how can you make any assertions about its consciousness or, or intelligence? So like, if you if you show the right side of the brain some like text, like written text, like they literally would not understand, like they would not know what to do. Whereas if you show it to the left side, they like be able to like move their hand and everything with it, to like perform the task. Um, and if we're so like the very interesting thing that happens is if you show the right side of the brain, uh, like in the right eye, you show some text that says like, draw a dog, um, or, or no, no, no. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, right? So, all right, so you basically prompt the right side of the brain sometimes like draw a dog. Um, you have, they, like it can't understand language, so you have to do something else. Uh, but somehow you get the right side of the brain to start drawing a dog with its left hand. Um, we allow the left side of the brain to see the, the, the drawing. So now there's this drawing over here. The guy is drawing the dog with one of the hands and the left side of the brain sees this um, with, with the opposing eye or whatever, right? But, yeah. But the left side of the brain never got access to the instruction that caused it to start drawing, right? There's no, there's no access to it. So what it does instead is that the language part of the brain just starts making stuff up. It's, it's just like, uh, you you ask it like why are you drawing a dog and it's like I really like dogs I used to have a dog when I was a child like this is like an actual empirical thing they've demonstrated on like at least like ten or fifteen people I I actually have no idea about the numbers it's not like it's not like hundreds or thousands of people but like at least like ten or fifteen individuals with split brains have, like they've they've shown this to be the case um, yeah any other thoughts on uh, split brain patients yeah John yeah. I uh, know it, it's called it's 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 because of epilepsy. So like uh, it, it, the corpus callosum. Basically, what happens is if you have like a ton of activity over here, um, your epilepsy will basically spread to the entire brain. Uh, but as soon as you sever the corpus callosum, uh, epilepsy can't spread from one side of the brain to the other. So it like turns out it like reduces like epilepsy or like seizure um, intensity and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is like. Uh, this is Okay. <laughs> but um, apparently, uh, I think 
Impulse is like a slowly called Jill Taylor. Uh, she basically had a stroke and like the whole left leg of her brain went out. She claimed she experienced her mom. She gave like a whole TED talk about it. So okay. That, that was interesting. <laughs> interesting. So she had a stroke and then she thought she got enlightened. Yeah, she said she felt like like the whole body part was mine, which is which is like what you said. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. yeah and, totally. and then um yeah, she, she said like she had like an enlightening experience in the Interesting. She was like, she was like a bad summer she had a stroke or something, and she was like dog out. She's like, I looked at my body and was like, I could see like she's made out of like she just like felt like she was like made out of Intriguing. Intriguing. Now I kind of want to have a stroke. <laughs> Not really though, it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting, yeah. There's like, I feel like until like, not even a hundred years ago, like 50, 30 years ago, fMRI did not exist until 30, tw- like 30 years ago. Um, these kind of questions were so much more hand wavy, but I think slowly more and more we're able to like answer them with to a degree more confidence, right? We can at least rule out certain kind of uh, in like ideological setups uh, that require us to, to say something about the brain or, or whatnot. Um, so then Cartesian dualism. So uh, like basically the question is like, is Nyaya Vaisheshka dualism the exact same thing as like Descartes dualism? Um, is anyone here familiar with like Cartesian mind-body dualism? Yeah, so like the idea there is like, uh, how is like mind connected to body? We'll talk a bit more about that. But um, the, the difference here is that is thought fundamental to self or is it a quality? In Cartesian dualism, thought is like fundamental to self, right? He has like cogito et resum, like I think, therefore I am. Uh, thought there is is very clearly thought. He's not saying like I I like I I perceive myself, therefore I am. Like I'm I'm conscious, therefore I am. Uh, it's very clearly like I'm able to make like a logical stream of thought. Um, I be, I'm able to perform inference. Um, and that's, that's like why I exist. Um, so thought is very fundamental in Cartesian dualism uh, to the mind. Whereas in Nyaya Vaisheshika dualism, um, thought is uh, another, it's like another ontological category. Um, it's like a mental state, right? And uh, a mental state means that like, so you, you have this, you have this self, mental states like come, and like mental states like go. But like the perceiver itself, like the, the Atman, is like what remains. Um, and when you, re- but whereas in like Cartesian dualism, uh, you have like the, the mind and you have self, like, I guess, like, yeah, I guess you can think of it as recurrent processes, right? Thoughts, per- thoughts create other thoughts, the other thoughts, like, create other thoughts, blah, 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 blah. Um, you have, like, like, thoughts are within the mind here, whereas uh, thoughts are just. Mental states are just like qualities that flow through the Atman in the in the Nyaya Vaisheshika school. So it's kind of different. Um, so what would moksha be like in this setup? Uh, the goal of, of a lot of these uh, orthodox Hindu systems are moksha, right? Uh, but moksha in the Nyaya Vaisheshika system is is a is to become a qualityless but unique substance, right? So like throw away this mental state and just to be this thing. So like the other schools make fun of Nyaya by saying like uh, moksha to the Nyaya is to become a stone, right? Because like if you're just like a rock, like like just this on its own is basically a rock because like it, it has no, nothing in it changes, nothing in it uh, feels anything. It just like is, which like they say is like kind of sad. Like there's no like, like why would you want moksha, blah, blah, blah. Um, cool. Any closing thoughts on Nyaya by Sheshika? Anyone want to try saying Nyaya Vaisheshika? Okay, that's like pretty decent. Uh, have I talked about how the first Sha and the second Sha are different? I think I, oh. I, oh, so one of them is palatal and one of them is retroflex. Does anyone know what that means? Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. So the, the first one is, uh, uh, it's like Sha. It's, so it's like Sha. So it's like she, she, she. Okay. But, but but that basically means the first one, the first one you articulate in the same part of your mouth as you articulate cha, and the second one you articulate in the same part of your mouth as you articulate cha. 
Yeah, so it's like, yeah, so like this one is like this, that's your tongue. And then uh, uh, it's like a label. Actually, no, that's a bad drawing. Uh, it's a label, which means, uh, yeah, like that. So that's your tooth, and then this is the top of your mouth. Uh, this is sha, oh, and then sh, yeah, sha, and then this is sh, sh, sh. So this is this is sha, this is sha. So like most modern like Hindi speakers have like merged these two sounds, but in Sanskrit they're like different sounds. And like and like teach and like your Hindi teacher and parents will be like, yeah, this one's sha and this one's sha, and they'll like say the same sound yeah. and they'll be like, no, they're different. Just trust me. But like they're they're like actually like like they're they're like in, they're like actually articulated different parts of that. So like if you say cha and then and then uh, like in cha you you connect the tongue to the roof of the mouth. It's called a plosive or an African type of thing. Um, but here you leave a small space, right? So that the air flows through here. Uh, similar thing over here when you say uh, the tip of your tongue goes through through your mouth um, and but with sha there's air that flows through it. yeah air, air flows through in both of these cases so like this this sound is the same as this sound except air flow, flows through the top and this sound is the same as this sound except air flows through the top. this one the, oh, I see. yeah this is like, uh, and this is kya, this is uh. So kya, be kya becomes sha, kya becomes sha. Yeah. Yeah. So is it like nyaya vaisheshika? Sheshi. Please, please. The first one is this one. Shesh. Yeah. And this is the, the root. The root, uh, so shesh is the is the guna form of the root shish, which means like div to divide or to like separate. Um, so, so there's a uh, like other other, um, so like vishish means to like pull apart to like divide or to like qualify. Um, and in another place, you see the same root vishish. Uh, vishish is like. Do like do, can anyone think of like where else you see this? Vishishta Dvaita, right? Like qualified non-dualism. Uh, but yeah, so like shish with shesh. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, okay, Sankhya Yoga. This is another form of dualism um, that we've talked about a bit before. So uh, here you have this duality between Purusha and Prakriti. We've talked a lot about this, I think. Um, who remembers like Purusha versus Prakriti? Okay, yeah, so I, we've, we've mentioned those two terms before. Um, basically, what they say is that you have like multiple purushas. Purushas are like uh, per not perceiving, but like conscious selves, right? They're independent um, and they each experience reality, but they experience, uh, they experience property reality separately. Um, so you have a bunch of these purushas, these like souls, I guess you can think of it as, and then you have one property, this like universe that obeys physical laws and like, uh, evolves over time through these like various laws. Um, the way they constructed in Sankhya, the way they construct property in Sankhya is like these 24, um, these 24 ontological categories. Uh, you start with Mula Prakriti, which is like fundamental nature. And then from that arises Buddhi, intellect. Um, from intellect arises ego, right? So you have intellectual, like logical ability. Like you start out with intellectual, logical ability. And then you have a bunch of like, input flows in over time, right? And then over time you develop like an ego that becomes like some fundamental like basis of self. Um, and then after that, like, like you also develop like manas, right? Manas is like the ability to like perceive uh, elements like interface with the world. Uh, so you, you, you use that as an interface to like get more information, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then uh, out of manas, they also say, so it's almost like building from the inside outside, right? Like we, we like to think uh, in the West of building reality from outside in, right? Like you have all these material things and then ma th these material things uh, feed into your uh, senses and these senses then go into your mind. 
but they basically go from the inside out where you start with this like fundamental prakriti and this mula prakriti is actually motivated by purusha which means that like the purusha the, the consciousness comes in contact with prakriti uh this mula prakriti and then it like causes this first act of creation of of buddhi and then blah blah blah, blah and you then eventually get like the entire world out there so it's almost like uh, like opening your eyes and like seeing the world and like everything sort of being rendered. Um, and they have like five senses, five motor action, like motor organs, uh, tan matra, tan matras and putas. So those are like elements. Blah, blah, blah. Um, the mind body problem also shows up here. Um, you have like intentional versus non-intentional mental state. And by that, we basically mean that like certain, certain mental states uh, have objects, right? So like we can be in a mental state where uh, we, so like a photo shirt, a purusha can be in, can only be in a non-intentional uh, mental, on, no, only a purusha can be in a non-intentional mental state, right? So a purusha can, uh, you have like this floating disembodied uh, purusha, right? And it can just be in a non-intentional mental state, which means there's no object inside of it. There's, it isn't perceiving anything. It's just, it's just being. Um, and then you can also have intentional mental states where you, uh, where you have, uh, where you're like thinking about something explicitly, right? So your attention is focused on something that is an intentional mental state. Um, and basically the, the, the Samkhya Yogins would say that uh, intentional mental states are entirely physical. Uh, they, they, they are entirely on the property side, right? So you have your buddhi, which becomes aware of some object, right? Like sees a tree or something like that. Uh, and then that becomes the object <coughs> of the buddhi. Uh, and then the buddhi <coughs> itself is another property object, which is within the uh, consci consciousness of the purusha. Um, so basically the, the idea here is that you don't have a mind-body dualism, but rather a consciousness-mind dualism, right? You have this internal uh, purusha, and then you have like buddhi, uh, purusha, and you have like the buddhi, and then like the, the world out there, right? Like the putas and everything. Um, and basically the, the Sankhya Yogins draw the line over here. They say that purusha is purusha and all of this is prakriti. Uh, so all these intentional mental states that have objects um, are entirely physical. We can entirely describe them with the laws of physics. Um, but, this non-intentional mental state, purusha being being for itself, right? Just uh, being conscious, like pure phenomenology. Um, that they say is is non-physical, and that's where they draw the line between mind and body, or rather, like consciousness and mind. Um, so it's a different line that they draw. Uh, the, the the Cartesians would basically draw the line over here. They say that this is all body, this is all mind, but we're drawing a different line in, in this. Uh, approach to, to self. Um, phenomenology of Purusha, this is just like, uh, so like phenomena, is anyone familiar with like phenomenology as like a school of thought in the West? So it's like a continental philosophical tradition. Um, basically the idea is that like uh, you cannot, like, like it is it is exceedingly different, to, exceedingly difficult to capture in words uh, what it is like to be. So uh, this is like Husserl and, and uh, Heidegger and whatnot, they basically study what it is like to be and try to somehow come up with adequate ways of describing um, being, um, which is very hard, right? Like you can't really capture what it feels like to be. You can only capture like the objects, right? Um, like I can say like, I am perceiving a marker, right? Like, like I, I see a red marker and all this. Um, like first, like what do those words mean? And second of all, like a, a camera can see a red marker, but it doesn't like feel like anything to be a camera. Whereas for me, when I see this red marker, like the the sense of feel the sense of being feels like something so that's like what mainly phenomenology is concerned with and uh, that's that's like that sense of being that sense of self is, is what Purusha concerns itself with as well um, yeah but, but how do we know that how do we I mean it sounds like a silly question but how do we know that we have those kind of experiences we don't, right? So that's where like you have this idea of metaphysical solipsism comes in, um, where uh, you don't know whether anyone else, whether it feels like to be anything, to, to be anyone else or anything else, right? You can only ever be certain of your own, uh, your own like phenomenological self, right? 
you can only ever say that like I know that it feels like something to be. Um, and then you try to make like fair extrapolations <clears throat> to say, I I I feel like something. Roshan is like sort of like me. He's like a human and like can speak and everything. So like therefore, I think like he probably feels like something too. But I guess there's also like a potential logical fallacy here of like assuming that certain qualities are inherently signs of consciousness. So I think we are inclined to believe that just because someone can talk and like talk about their experience um, and say things and use language, that then we should assume that it feels like something to be them. Whereas I don't think that's necessarily true, right? Is there any inherent link between language and uh, a feeling of self? What do you guys think? Does being able to speak inherently mean, like if someone is talking, if someone talks about what it feels like to be themselves, is that proof that they feel like something? Right, exactly. So like GPT-3 and all these language models, these huge neural nets can talk about like, I went on a walk today. I, uh, I, love, I love eating pizza. Like, shut up, bro. Like <laughs> you're, you're a box of linear algebra. Uh, like, it probably doesn't feel like I need to Like therefore they're listening. <laughs> they are listening, they are listening. But uh, yeah, I guess my point is like, it's, it is, it's hard to know. And there's like a lot of uh, um, thought experiments. Have you ever heard of like pea zombies? Has anyone heard of like pea zombies? Yeah, Nathan, you want to explain that? It's just the person who like, behaves the exact same way that you expect the other person to behave. Like the pea's and all of but they don't have, like they don't, they just have a more like, exact way. There's no like mind's eye with them. Yeah. I, I like I wouldn't say they don't think I'd say that like there's no like mind's eye right like there's uh they they can say like I am hungry I am a person blah blah, blah. um and they have these mental logical processes going on um they can make they can be very intelligent and everything as well um but it doesn't feel like anything to be them uh like if you like punch them in the face like they would say ow ow that hurt but like there would be no one there to like perceive, like there would be no one there to like actually feel like it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, like the living NPCs, right? So like the question is like, do P zombies exist? Uh, if you accept the, if you accept that it is possible for P zombies to exist, then you're basically saying that like there is a distinction here, the same distinction that Sonic the Yoga draws, that uh, you can have a property object that is not endowed with quarters now, but it but still behaves entirely by these physical laws that still have all this neural circuitry and whatnot. Um, whereas if you don't think that P zombies exist, then you think that then usually you'll you think that uh, like consciousness arises out of uh, this uh, pure kind of like natural matter, which uh, the Sankhya Yogans would disagree with. Cool. Any other thoughts here? All right, let's get into Roshan's favorite topic. <laughs> uh, so Advaita Vedanta. So who here has heard of Advaita Vedanta? Okay, I thought there would be more hands. But like, like no, like this is like the most. So like when people are like, yeah, Hindu philosophy, bro. They're like, they're talking about like this, like this thing. They're like talking about like basically like only the ideas that are on this slide, like this singular slide out of like the past <laughs> 10 weeks. Like when people are like Hindu philosophy, they're talking about like this line, um, which kind of sucks. Uh, but yeah, so like, yeah. So by the way, Dante is like basically dominated Indian philosophy since like 1200, 1300 AD, um, which seems like a long time, but there's like another 3000 years before that, that's basically completely discarded uh, when we're having philosophical conversations with the Norvies. Um, but so <laughs> here is the, uh, here is, yeah. So by the way, Dante, they basically have this view on the self uh, that's like non-dualism, which basically means there's no, uh, first of all, there's no distinction between all of ourselves, like, right, like our, our pure uh, phenomenological consciousnesses. There is no distinction between like mine and like John Martin's and like Milo's and like they're all the same. And like the thing that they're all identical with is this object, this entity they call Brahman, right? So like we've talked about that a lot. Um, not a lot, but like a bit. Um, so like what so like what distinguishes pure consciousnesses from each other, right? So if we throw away all of this stuff, if we throw away all the uh, all the material stuff, everything that like divides us, these like bodies and uh, all our past experiences and everything, like does anything distinguish like that pure self between us? Is there a distinction there? 
Yes, no, yeah, please. Uh-huh. Right. So I guess I guess this is similar to how like in uh in like particle physics, or not like we don't have to think that complicated, but like you can have two electrons, right? When two electrons have like quantum state, yeah. What are particles that don't have any quantum state? Oh yeah, yeah, photons, right? So if we have two photons, uh let's say we have two. Is it abbreviation for that thing or five? Gamma? Oh, it is gamma. It is gamma. Yeah. Okay. That's like the stupidest abbreviation. Yeah, P is proton. But I wouldn't it be nice if it were five? That's like photon. Like that. Right? Like photon. Photon. That's literally how you spell it in UK. Uh, like okay. I don't know why they chose gamma. That's terrible choice. Uh, but okay, so like you have these two photons, right? Internally, they're like indistinguishable. They're just pure photonness. And if we like switch, actually, they do have a they do have a trait. They have velocity, right? No, no, no. They have they have direction. Don't they have direction? They have momentum. They have momentum, right? No, but that's not momentum. They do have momentum. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. I guess we'll say that like they're. It is possible for there to be like fundamental constituents of reality that are like completely non-indistinguishable. Let's say for purpose of this example that any two photons are completely non-indistinguishable, right? Any possible thing that you compare between these two, like you will literally not be able to tell the difference. Um, they're like pure, they're like identical, right? Um, if we switch these two, like we would not know the difference. Um, and I guess the question is then like, it, it becomes more of a semantic question, right? Um, are these two photons the same object? Um, I think some people would say yes, and some people would say no. They're uh, if they're completely indistinguishable, um, they are in in a sense the same object, right? In the real world, we like if we have two dogs, obviously, like we can say they're both dogs, but we don't call them the same because, like, obviously, we can still distinguish between them, right? Like one of them might have stripes, one of them might have spots, blah blah blah. But when you have just pure uh, atoms that have no distin distinguishing properties, then I think it becomes increasingly harder to say whether they're identical or like they're the same object or not. Yeah. Yeah. So they they are like two distinct things. They are indeed two distinct things, but there is no like is there a is there like a universal photon out there that is like I am the photon that inheres in all other photons. Like, like, does that exist? Like, I mean, oh, objectively, no. no, right? Right, but like, how do all photons know how to exist? Then, like, how how do they know how to do photon things? I mean, how do they know? That? First of all, photons, like, from the perspective of a photon, they're like static subatomic. Yeah, yeah, or they don't have time. Yeah. So like, <laughs> they don't like instinctively know how to do anything. No, but like obviously they don't have a brain, right? But they, they like, like if you like balance a photon against a mirror, like it's gonna like do something. Like it's not just gonna like, it's not just gonna like disappear or whatever. Like it it will, it will follow certain laws. So like how can it do that without like inheriting something? Like it having some inherent property and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, when the is disappeared, the rest of the photon is like someone thought. That sort of a, that like supposes that yourself is the, the change of yourself, the way like, within your mind and body is like a distinct object from yourself. They'd say, I, I feel like they'd say, wait, so if I was, in, if I were in your shoes, um, it's sort of a semantic thing. I'd say, I'd say that they'd say, um, at a basic level, right? If if you were a preliminary student of Advaita Vedanta, they'd say it's it's like a great thing, right? Like it's important to think how, like whether you think differently if you were in another person's shoes. Uh, but then, like at a more complex level, I think they'd say that like you're confusing self with, with like with, like you're confusing Atman with like uh, like ahankara, like like identity, right? Um, or ego, right? Like 
the reason why we might think different things is because we've had different experiences and we have like different like neuronal uh, morphology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the fundamental self here is the same. So what, what the advice would really say is that like, when you say, if I were in your shoes, um, what you're really saying is if, um, if you were to use my neuronal, if you were to use my neuronal physiology, um, which is different, they'd insist, from the Atman. Um, because Atman is like Yeah, exactly, right? And it, it might like, like modern Advaitins might say that like it might reside in the brain somehow, um, but like it is not, it is not the brain. Um, yeah, Chris. Um, what they'd say is that all of this is like not real. So let, let me let me like it's all uh Maya. So uh, let, let me uh, go through the rest of this argument. So um, what distinguishes pure consciousness from each other? Basically nothing, right? They're they're all Brahman. Um, all of these consciousnesses are identical. Um, and they're all basically uh, there's like different ways to interpret this. Like either they're different instantiations of the Brahman or they're different, uh, like they're like smaller pieces of the Brahman, et cetera. Um, and those have different like metaphysical implications, blah, 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 whatever. Um, uh, so then uh, one example they give is like consciousness persists through or after like deep sleep, right? Uh, we were like awake uh, and then we, uh, this is an eye and you're awake and then like you close your eyes uh, and then you like dream, right? This like the second stage and then you close your eyes and you're uh, not dreaming anymore, but like you're, uh, you like, you don't dream, but you're like in deep sleep or whatever. And then there's like a fourth stage where it's like, uh, you are so deep in sleep that like there is nothing going on in your brain. It's just like being. And, and they're saying that like, uh, how, how can, uh, we, have, we definitely have Atman over here, right? There's like a perceiver over here. There's a perceiver over here. There's probably some kind of perceiver over here. But like, is there a perceiver over here? Yes, no. Like, is there, is there oh, rather than perceiver, I should be saying like, is there a self? Is there a self over here in deep sleep? Yes, no. Like, is there, is there an Atman present in the three? Yeah. The, the deepest of the four stages of No, in your opinion. Yeah, yeah, sort of, right? Um, you're saying that this emerges from, uh, like, yeah, like having an object to perceive. Yeah, I think it's not even like there's some self that doesn't have access to the Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's what they'd say too. And the specific argument they make is like, uh, since we have self over here, and then like we can wake up after this, and like we can still be aware of this, and like we remember this, we, we remember this. Um Basically, they say that there has to be a continuity here, right? This has to be, that was like the worst depiction of continuous. There, this is like continuous. Um, so that means that there must be a self here as well. Um, so like self is always present, this Atman is always present, um, which basically means that uh, the subject can appear without the object, right? Because here, there is no object in the self. Over here, 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 there, there are objects of thought, um, Whereas in Thuria, there is no there is no object that, that the Atman is conscious of. So that means the subject can appear without the object. But can the object ever appear without the subject? We talked about this a couple of classes ago. Like, have you ever seen the world without like seeing? Like, like without like being your without feeling like you're seeing something? Um, like is there a is there is there ever a situation in which there is not a consciousness to go along with and a per, like a perception of like an objective? thing so like they basically say like that never appears so the subject is more permanent than the object right this 
this self is more permanent than, than the objects that it perceives, that, that it becomes aware of. Um, so that means that they basically say that this, this Atman, which they equate with Brahman, is more real, and everything, uh, all, all, the, all the things in the material world, right, like the trees and whatnot, and the dreams and all this, all of this is Maya, right? Uh, just like dreams come and go, they say that like trees and things in the real world come and go, like what always exists is, is the self. So basically like matrix. Uh, yeah. Uh, sort of. I mean, it's like the matrix in the sense that they think that like all of this is like an element. Yeah. Yes. I would think that the proposition that the matrix is the whole state. Even the third state is like part of the matrix. I can't understand it. It's like it could be a matrix where it's just like I don't see how they can still distinguish that. Yeah. It should be like in my eyes. Yeah, I'm also very hazy on this. And I feel like if you, if you throw away this fourth stage, you can still make the argument that you put the third stage, right? Uh, like a stage of sleep in which there is no, uh, like there is no object of thought. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they make the distinction of the fourth stage. Uh, yeah, I'm not like familiar enough with that. Um, yeah. Uh, one other thing they say is like, the subject doesn't recognize it's like, uh, people will say like, okay, well, it isn't the case that, like I, I never see through like, John Martin's or like Milo's eyes, right? I never see it through someone else's eyes. The world doesn't appear as though I am the same self as everyone else. So why, why is that the case? Why, why, does it, why do I not recognize that I am the perceiver, the, the, the subject of, of all interactions? And basically he says that like Shankara, the, the, the guy who basically uh, sort of sets down the founding tenets of Advaita Vedanta, uh, Shankara says that, um, the subject doesn't recognize itself just like a knife can't cut itself, right? Um, there is no, there's like, you need some kind of recursive relation and that just like cannot exist. Um, a subject can't become aware of itself just like that, like Brahman cannot become aware of itself. Uh, only the individual selves can, can exist and uh, become aware of, of themselves, but not Brahman as a whole, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and like it's it's dependent on Maya, right? Like this material world, and it's dependent on your face, which they say are all. Yeah. Uh, how so? <laughs> I feel like that's a stretch. I mean, uh, like we can obviously like bend a knife like really hard and like make it cut itself, but like like that's not their point, right? Like their point is just that like um, there, like I guess it's it's very genuine in the sense that there are classes of objects in which there is a recursion relation and there's other classes of objects in which there aren't. Um, can anyone think of like uh, recursive objects in the real world? Uh, huh? Rush? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. well, uh, not really because you have separate dolls, right? That, that sort of go into each other. Um, huh? Yeah, but those are like mathematical objects. I, I guess like, like I'm trying, like I'm trying to say, if we cannot think of a uh, recursive object in the real world, then we've done the Advaitin's job for them and basically shown that like, see, like there is no recursion in the real world. Just like that, there's like, there's no recursion of self. Uh, like the, the self cannot perceive itself and that's why it seems like everything is separate. Yeah, there's, oh, okay, cool. Um, so the Chandogya, so blah, 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 that's like a famous quote where you get Tatamamasi, which is like this Mahavakya, um, like great saying. Um, the Vishesha Advaitin response, which is, the, which is another school of Vedanta, uh, they basically say that uh, there is like the, the Advaitin calls this Toriya stage to be content, contentless consciousness, right? There is no content of the consciousness here. But in like common speech, we don't call it contentless consciousness, we call it unconscious, right? We say that there is no consciousness here. So basically, he says that like this, uh, this self, this, um, yeah, this self is not some like 
a grand persisting everlasting Brahman, but rather you, it, it is it is an individual Atma, uh, which which has its own properties and so on and so on. Um, and he also says that like all consciousness is intentional. So like all uh, uh, every every stage that consciousness exists in, uh, it has an intention. Have you ever perceived a stage of consciousness in which uh, there is no object of consciousness? Um, uh, the enlightened people will say like, yeah, like I, I've been there. Like I felt what it feels like to, to not have an object of consciousness. Uh, but Ramanuja basically says that like, um, like that, that's like a false sense of enlightenment or whatever. Um, uh, true, true enlightenment is like through whatever, like moksha things that Vishishtadvaitans talk about. Um, which I should know about because like my family's vicious dad by then, but like I, I, I don't. Uh, okay, so then we have a uh, we have like two more slides, like like this second last slide. Um, Buddhism has this view called anatman or anatta in Pali, which basically means like no self. Um, uh, the Buddha himself denies the existence of that which is permanent, controllable by uh, controllable by the individual or person, and doesn't lead to suffering. Um, and basically that like rules out the traditional like Ostika sense of uh, Atman. Um, instead, they, they posit this evolving bundle, this Pudgala of psychophysical states, which consists of material forms, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is intuitively what a lot of modern people think of when they think of self, right? Uh, you, we have this very physicalist sense in the, well, in the West of having all these atoms in the brain that construct neurons, you have these experiences that shapes this, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the physicalist view does not account for phenomenology. And that's sort of like this, the big like modern problem in, in mind-body dualism. Um, how do you make the leap from talking about mental states and all of this uh, to then talking about uh, consciousness, right? Awareness. Uh, and while in the West, it seems like we're shifting goalposts, right? In the West, it seems like we're shifting goalposts because historically, mind-body dualism has been about mind on one side, all these thought processes. Uh, not distinguishing between awareness and thought on one side, and then on the other side we have body and material. Um, and physicalism has now ex has now explained these thought processes, right? It's, it's explained what they it's explained into like you know these computers that can do amazing things. Um, so now in the West we've had to shift the goalposts of mind body dualism to say, okay, no, that's not what we're what we're talking about. We're talking about phenomenology. We're talking about awareness, self. Whereas from the, the Indian tradition point of view, um, the the uh, physicalism has still completely failed to explain Atman or, or Purusha, right? Uh, this awareness is still completely an open question, and there has been no proof whatsoever to show how uh, awareness can emerge from uh, can emerge from some physical process. Um, so yeah, I, I guess uh, the the Buddhist kind of Anatman view is a lot more akin to what we'd like to say in from a modern Western point of view. Uh, there is no universal self. Um, and you can't perceive the self. Uh, oh yeah, I, I, yeah. There is no universal self. Everything is just like this momentary bundle of like physical elements. And uh, another proof they give is that like you can't perceive a self because all perceptions are momentary, right? That's like one of their fundamental epistemological tenets. Uh, that all perceptions are momentary, right? This this marker is like a uh, momentary percept uh, uh, within this like uh, within my uh, ob object of consciousness experience. Um, so I, uh, uh, and since, since the self, since we have to perceive self with some sense of perception, um, that, that perception would also be momentary, which would make the self momentary, um, which would make it no longer self by definition. Um, uh, opposite, like opposition to them brings up the system, brings up memory, right? Like how can we have memory if we're just this bundle of like, constantly changing things? And then in turn have this theory of, uh, impressions, vasanas, uh, which are basically like you get some information impressed onto you, and then that persists over time if you remember it, and then you can recall it at some later point in time. So very similar to, to the Western approach um, in terms of uh, physicalism. Um, kind of a modern book that connects this to uh, recent research in psychology is Yunardin Ganeri's Attention Not Self, where he talks about how attentional processes in the mind are what construct momentary selves. So when when we become when we attend to a marker, for example, or when I attend to the thought I'm thinking, um, myself entirely encapsulates that thought, and like I basically become identical with that object, right? So we have this marker. Um, basically, what like while uh, 
while the Advaita might say that like this is like in my in the realm of my consciousness where I I become that like it, it comes into the subject and then I can disappear from the subject, it can reappear from the subject. Instead, the the, the Buddhists would say that um, like when I focus my attention on on this uh, on this percept and I become entirely focused on this, the the Pudgala becomes entirely infused with uh, with this. So like, I ba I basically become the market. Uh, that, that's something like like the, what they'd say, right? Um, all that exists to me is this momentary percept of the marker, um, and there is no self that is like capturing it, but rather there's this momentary percept. Yeah, Chris. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's more complicated, right? They, they more so give this example of like focusing on a single object to say that, like, you can, uh, like, a single percept can entirely capture your point of view, right? Which which goes against what the Advaita would say, where you have like subject that persists and object that comes and goes. Instead, they basically say like, from one Buddhist point of view, like within the within the Buddhist, there's like many different camps. But one point of view is that like, um, the object is like more real than the subject, right? The subject is just all these psychophysical things that come and go. But obviously, you can all like in most of reality, we have like a bunch of different. Uh, stimuli where we're simultaneously attending to a lot of different things, and those are what like come and go, etc., etc., over time. Yeah, yeah. Do you think this relates to self attention? Self attention, right? So in in transformers, uh, there's a like like neural nets. Um, there's a specific architecture. Uh, not even an architecture. It's like a what do you call it? I I wouldn't call it an architecture. It's like a yeah, I guess called like self attention, where you uh, basically have a bunch of vectors, and each of them attend to themselves, uh, as well as everything else. Uh, okay, but whatever you get the point. Like it's basically all event squared because uh, n elements attend to all n other elements. Um, there's some very out there theories that uh, I think uh, what's the name? Jurgen Schmidt Huber has had about like how. Uh, like the recursion relation and like self attention leads to consciousness and like GPD three is conscious. Ilya Sutskever also like famously posted on uh, um, on Twitter a, a few weeks ago or like a month ago. Uh, like it may be the case that GPT three is slightly conscious uh, and like everyone in the NLP community like clowned him for that. Um, so that was kind of memes. I also I also tweeted uh, I also tweeted this. Yeah. And I got zero likes. Uh, the the reason I found this funny is because mat like so like tatvamasi is like this famous like Vedantin phrase. And then I thought I was being smart by saying like matvamasi, which is like mat like matrix, right? This like it's like like mat like like uh, <laughs> this like the short form of for mat. Like if you look at PyTorch, it's like mat dot like thirty two blah 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 whatever, right? So I was like, oh, like you are matrices that is what you are like, like wow great but i got no likes or retweets so yeah that's sad yeah it, it, it's a it's I, I think like the intersection the intersection of like machine learning people and like classical philosophy people <laughs> is like is like this <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <you know. laughs> uh, i hope i hope this class becomes full of enlarges this intersection though hopefully, hopefully. one day one day Okay. It does. Oh yeah. Huh? Uh, like deep learning people and like Indian philosophy. And like the intersection is like not very good. Um. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, I just realized that an Atman sort of looks like Batman. Or uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a lake in Turkey called Batman. Like, like it's spelled like Batman. It's B A T M A N. I think it's actually the first result if you search Wikipedia for Batman. Uh, like, like ju just search it. Uh, it, it. It might, I don't know. There's a disambiguous, there's a definitely a disambiguation page for Batman. Um, and in that, it is there. Okay. All right. So we, we can check this after class. Uh, but, uh, okay. Last slide, sort of. Uh, uh, newer kind of point of view, this 
uh, like the Mimansa don't explicitly, like you, you'll notice we've talked a lot in the past weeks about Mimansa, um, but they aren't very concerned with, with questions of self. They aren't, questioned with, they aren't concerned with uh, this whole awareness kind of thing. Like they basically say that like, um, it's sort of like the Wittgen Shinian, like uh, that which you cannot, uh, like some things are beyond words and like it is useless to try talking about them. I think that I think that's the reason the Mimansakas don't like talk about it that much. While they do acknowledge some like, uh, there's probably some like crazy metaphysics going around, going on with self. Um, ultimately, it's useless to talk about that which we can't put words to, right? Um, and the the Vedantins explicitly describe Brahman. They describe Brahman as being like indescribable, um, which is sort of paradoxical. But like the idea is that like you can't put words to it. So the Mimansakas are are sort of sort of like falling in line there in the sense that they don't they don't put any words to it, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so huh? Yeah, right. That, that's that's what I'm saying. It's a paradox. Like to call Brahman like wordless or indescribable is like to put a word to it, and that's actually like a, a rhetorical strategy uh, that the Vishishta Advaitins then use to say that like uh, Brahman must by by that property have qualities, right? Like it must you must be able to assert some qualitative aspects of, of Brahman. Um, okay, so then uh, I guess Mimansa doesn't talk about it that much, but like I think uh, they'd probably uh, agree a lot with like the older like Vaidika sense of of self, of identity, um, like how do you, so like I'll start with like how, how would we define an and entity, right? Entities are defined in relation to other entities. Can, can you think of like an, a definition that is like non-relational? Um, like a definition of something that doesn't rely on anything else to define it. Right, like you, so like if it's an intentional definition, right, so like you're, you're talking about like evens as like um, and such that like and modular to zero. Like, oh, you could be like, oh, see, we're not defining this with, with the left relation to anything else, but like we really define it with, with like all these symbols and whatnot. Um, so, uh, so like, and then, and then we, but if we have an existential definition, right, where we say zero, two, four, six, blah, blah, blah. blah an existential definition is obviously also related to other things because we've defined this class of evens as uh, being related to zero, two, four, six, blah, 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 blah. So at least on a mathematical level, everything is relational, right? Um, all definitions somehow relate to other things. So how is it possible to define an entity without relation to anything else? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, like in, in traditional like number theory, or like in a type theory, like how do you find, define zero? Zero is like a base space, right? Um, so like if, if you have, so if you basically say like, what are the naturals? Um, the class of naturals is equal to zero or uh, or, or uh, like suck. And I also really like the abbreviation of success. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so but that basically means that like, but, but like I mean, it's uh, it's still defined in relation to all of these other naturals, isn't it? Um, at least within this within the definition of natural numbers. Is that not like a vice versa definition though? Like I don't think that's a vice versa. Like if the naturals are defined with respect to zero. Oh, that doesn't zero, mean... like that doesn't mean that zero is defined. If you could say zero is one minus one, yeah, but like if you were to just take zero as an entity, it's not defined with respect to the naturals. The same way, like, I mean, because then you could have zero defined with like multiple things, like you can have the zero is defined with respect to the real system. Hmm. Well, as far as like the other guys, like zero is just. Right, like it's entirely arbitrary. It's just like, yeah. It's you know, so much. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that much, like, number theory one, yeah. but it's just like a thought. Yeah, I guess there's certain, like, base, like, when we get to base cases, then we sort of, it sort of feels like we have something independent. But I don't know, like, in other situations, we might define zero as, like, the identity, the identity object for, like, addition, right? Like. Like, uh, I don't know, like I'm not like a big group theory guy, but like when you have like a group uh, over like, uh, actually I, I don't want to put this in notation because I definitely don't know what I'm talking about. 
but like uh, the like the idea is that like you have like a certain uh, like in your set you're going to have a certain object with respect to which your group um, your group operation is invariant. So that basically means like if our group operation is addition, um, zero is going to be the thing that's invariant to right. One plus zero is still one. Two plus zero is still two. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I guess in certain situations, zero is like defined as like an invariant like that. Um, I don't know, but I see what you mean though, that like uh, at least um, a lot of these base case definitions seem to be entirely like for themselves. Um, like you can't break them down further. Um, well, did you say like zero is like that which is not, but the, that which is not is like a negative addition of that which is. Mm. It's like an inherent value. But then, like, doesn't the question arise, like, isn't anything physical inherently contingent on these terms for other? Like, not and yeah, like, is. like, is and is not something like yin and yang. Yeah, I, I guess uh, like negation is super important, but we, we haven't explicitly defined zero as like the negation of anything here, right? Um, I guess like what Nathan said, like like at least in Kano's axioms, and uh, even in uh, uh, what, like like ZFC set theory, right? Like even in traditional set theory, uh, you have like the empty, so zero is defined as an empty set, right? Like, uh, is that the same thing as in Kano or Um, right. I mean, or it was just like. I think in pianos, if you just have, like, you just have an arbitrary variable and you have a successor function. Yeah, exactly, right? But, like, again, it doesn't have to be a set. Like, we could, we could say, like, this is, like, one, two, five, seven, three. And then we could call that, like, our base case, right? Like, our, our set thing. Right? We could have, like, an arbitrary string of symbol, symbols uh, and call that our, like, we could have, and then we can be like, yeah, that's like our base case. And then like you have successors, right? Which is basically gonna be like, like the, the sets around like copy paste, I guess. Right? Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, how we define this is entirely arbitrary. Um, so I guess it's contextual, right? Like different areas of math, like will treat zero in different ways. But it seems like, at least with this and like ZFC, where you're like the empty set, even this is like in relation to like these two brackets, like emptiness. And this also goes to like syntax and semantics, right? Like this is a syntactic definition, but like what is the semantic interpretation of the empty set is like entirely uh, variable, right? Like in this situation, we're interpreting it as zero, but like we don't have to. Um, okay. Uh, so basically, what we'll say is like self. Um, We'll, we'll basically take for granted that like definition is always relational regardless of whether it's intentional or existential. Um, and I guess like a very hand wavy way to say that zero is not related. To, zero is a relational definition is that like we're saying, like, see, like it's this symbol, like this symbol is zero, therefore it's like a relational definition. But I guess, uh, so, so like self is defined in relation to other selves, just like everything is defined in relation to other selves. There is no way to define anything without relation to other things. Um, all definitions are relational. So it's ultimately futile to try to say that uh, self is absent of any of these relations, right? Uh, no matter how much you try to like separate these two, separate uh or Atman from uh, Prakriti or, or this Maya kind of reality, uh, the way you define a self is always going to be related somehow to other selves or to, to material reality. And at least in, in like, Pra pragmatically, uh, people always use self um, in this kind of like relational setup. Uh, so then the question doesn't become how do we escape from this kind of relational definition? How do we go? How do we? It's no longer how do we sever all these relational ties, but it rather becomes how do we define ourselves optimally? How do we define ourselves in relation to the things that like we want to be defined in relation to? Um, to meet, like, to, to, to fulfill the, the, the duties that we're supposed to fulfill. I'd say that that's like a sort of refined version of the actual like Vaivika uh, kind of point of view on, on what self is. Um, cool, I think that's about it. Uh, any other closing thoughts or uh, critiques of this?
which is obviously very different from the other kind of uh, uh, Ostica opinions on self we talked about. Oh, I did not. You always catch me for not answering the icebreaker. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I, I will define myself relationally uh, in some way. I, I'll say that I am, I am proudly, uh, uh, like I, I, I will proudly define myself in relation to other things and I won't make an attempt to uh, sort of sever connections and be like, I am some free floating Hoffman or Photoshop. That would be that would be my view. Yeah, Nathan. Since the idea of being Hoffman and positioning myself out there is more of like a philosophical, more philosophical problem, I find that the best definition of the person probably is sort of right. So I I this isn't a traditional viewpoint within the Mimasa. The Mimasa don't have a strong view on selfhood, so I've sort of like reconstructed something that I like based on like Vedic texts that, that I think is like fair to say. Um, but it is both, it is, it is a problem on both those levels. The Mimansas are not pragmatists with respect to word meaning. They say that word meaning is like eternal and independent, that each word has like an inherent meaning. Um, and like the process of language learning is like finding out those meanings. It's not, it's not creating meaning, it's finding meaning. Um, and I guess you can extrapolate the same thing to like self or physically, right? That like these connections already exist, right? What you're related to, in this world based on your upbringing, like who you are, et cetera, et cetera, those already exist. And it's a question of how do you realize what those underlying connections actually are? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, almost. But I mean, also it's important to realize that like, uh, like I guess this goes back to like, like Chomsky and like nativism, right? You have nativism versus empiricism in linguistics where the empiricists say that like, tabula rasa right like you come in as a blank slate and you learn everything whereas the nativists say that there's like some kind of underlying uh, genetic or like neuronal morphology that causes you to uh, go about doing language in some way so it's not necessarily you are what you eat it's like you are uh like you are what you eat plus c to quote my teacher uh, uh, anyone else um so if In one thing that you mentioned, what if you have this um, reality where it's like literally just your mind? Like, if you want to come in, like, are there other things like that? Like, you just have that mind. Like, you know, like, you know, like, um, so, the, the, a reality in which there is nothing else except the mind is exactly what the uh, what the Vedantins will, will say, like the Brahman is the only thing that exists and everything else is just uh, false. Like all those relations and everything like don't actually exist, they're, they're illusions. Um, I think the Mimansakas would say that, uh, yeah, like, like that's, that's just like not true. Like, 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 like look at like this marker, bro, like, like it exists. Uh, I, I think that would be like the response. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, any other kind of, yeah, final closing remarks or thoughts, questions, logistics, or I guess for logistics, I can turn off the screen share. Uh.